you know, careers are careers. I mean, football's a short one and they do come to an end, but not being able to like kind of go through it how you'd want to go through it, it's kind of tough to take as well, I suppose. We won the championship. We nearly got relegated the season after, first season in the Prem. And then the, the second year in the Prem, we go on and win it. Like, if you look at them as three years in football, it's it's just untouchable. I don't think you're going to get that. And then even the year after that, we got to the quarterfinals of the Champions League. It's not it's not something that happens all the time, that. Obviously, like, I'm sobering up and I'm in this cell and I'm thinking, this is not you at all. It's not you as a person. It's not how you want to be as a person. Like, you need to, you need to get hold of yourself here. Welcome to High Performance. Thank you. You seem like a man who's ready to talk. <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's start with some news then. That I suppose you should probably share the news rather than me, right? Uh, yeah, I guess I can do. Uh, I'd just probably like to announce my retirement, I think, from professional football. Uh, probably been a long time coming, maybe, especially with the last year. No, I think it's, I think it's time to officially announce it now. And how does it feel even saying that? Uh, do you know what? I didn't actually think it bothered me, but saying it then, it's almost like, you know, it's scratching the nerve a bit, but I think I've been ready for it. I think, like I said outside, you know, I think having not stopping at my peak and kind of it simmered down a little bit has kind of helped the uh, the transition, definitely. When was the moment where you thought, all right, that, that's it then? I think I've been in limbo for too long. I think I've either been kind of, wanting to play but not getting the opportunity to play at kind of a standard or a level where I felt valued and then you know you kind of wrestle yourself for quite a while and then you know I've had I've had maybe three training camps on my own and it's it's not easy like you know to find the motivation and stuff and then you've got to try and keep match fit which is almost impossible training you need games you need like to be around the lads you need you know you need constant training with the team so I just thought, like, I'm I'm wrestling here for no reason. I'm happy not playing football, yeah. but I'm happy playing football. So do I just shake hands with the sport kind of thing? So I, I can see, like, when you say I'd like to announce my retirement, you can see then, like, the emotion. <laughs> yeah. What does it stir in you when you say it? Yeah, I, I mean, you, it's, it's all I've known. It's been my life since I was six, seven years old, I think. So it's not, you know, it's never going to be, like, an easy thing. But like I said, I think... I think uh, I think the way it's kind of died down in a way has definitely helped. If it, Listen, if I was playing week in, week out and I, had to, and I had to say, like, I've got to stop maybe through injury or through just age, not being able to, like, get about the pitch like I'd like to, I think it'd be a trickier. Yeah. Yeah. And is it is there a level that you wouldn't consider playing at? Uh, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had quite a few offers from championship clubs and stuff. I just never felt like the burn. I just never, it just did nothing for me. I spent last year, the last year playing football on loan at Reading. Found, you know, I was I was unfit. Found the first six months like really hard. Last end of the season, uh, Paul Ince came in and, you know, just having his old school kind of methods and stuff really helped me. And then I kind of found my feet again towards the end. But uh, I mean, going into the season after that, not having been snapped up was kind of a bit of like a something don't feel right here kind of thing. So I think I think then it was like I either pushed on fitness wise by myself or I kind of just like I said just shook hands with the sport. What's that emotion like when you're a Premier League winner in his early thirties who was bought for multi millions of pounds by one of the biggest clubs in the country and suddenly like the offers aren't coming in. Do you, is it a sense of rejection? Do you feel forgotten about? What's the... Yeah, it's probably a bit of both. It's probably... I was... I must have been scratching my head for weeks. I, was, I remember... I remember uh, speaking to someone else in football and I was like, I just don't get it. How has no one, like, come and took a little chance, you know, just to get me really fit? Because they know what I'm capable of when I'm fit. Like, I just need to get fit. I think the game's changing anyway. I think it has changed. You know, since I've started to now, it's... It's totally different, but for someone not to like pull me in and be like, "Listen, we're going to get you like a machine again. Stick with us." I'll be like, "I'll be all over it, hundred percent. I'm there." And why do you think they haven't then done? I don't know. I just think it might have been, you know, I'm, without sounding, 
without sounding a bit silly, like I'm not going to be the cheapest player. So, you know, I, I do think now as a business project, clubs look at young players who they can make a bit of money off. I think that's the way football's gone. I don't think clubs look at experience like they once did, uh, especially, you know, if they've had a bit of trouble maybe off the pitch kind of thing going through it. I mean, bear in mind, I did, I did have options. I'm not saying I didn't have any options, yeah. but, you know, I, I didn't have options that I wanted. But I've seen Troy Deeney recently talk about this, uh, yeah. about he's gone on to play for Forest Green Rovers and he was talking about he just plugged into what he would have dreamt of being a professional footballer when he was a kid and saying, well, I'm still getting paid yeah. to play football. Was Is that not there for you? No, I just, I, I, I've never been, I've never been really obsessed with football. I've just absolutely loved it. So then the idea of, the idea of me dropping down is fine. I've not got a problem with that. It was, it was the idea of not playing to my worth. Like I, when I left United, I had this thing in the back of my head that was burning for years and it was to get back to like a top four or five team. And I think when I did that, it was almost like, you know, I'd, I'd not only proven it to, to myself, but it was almost like a, you know, kind of like a, a dig, like, shouldn't let me go, like, I'll prove you wrong kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think, I think that was kind of one of the big things that spurred me on throughout my career. It wasn't the thought of, dropping down leagues and stuff till I, till I can't move. It was the thought of, you know, kind of proving people wrong, I think. Yeah. So what did Manchester United teach you then about high performance? Oh, everything. Like, I, I, I can't remember anyone growing up at United and saying a bad thing. Like, literally from things off the field to everything on the field. It taught you how to behave. It taught you how to address people it taught you how to you know manage yourself on the pitch it was just you know it wasn't easy I'd, I'd, I'd seen kids like get cut at young ages like like friend, really good friends at the time and it wasn't easy but you know if if you was one of the the small minority that made it it was such a it was such a good thing and who were the people that you remember as being what we would call cultural architects who were the yeah. people around there setting the tone, letting you know the standards required at that football club. I mean, when you look at Sir Alex, he was always the king. And what about when you got towards the first team? Who were the players you looked at and thought, oh, that's the level, okay. Yeah. Oh, there was, there, I mean, I had, I was in the same building as Paul Scholes, Roy Keane, Gary Neville. Like, there was, there was just, the motivation, you just turned the corner in the corridor and it was like, wow. Like, you know, you were almost like starstruck and you, you, you literally in the gym next to them it was it was a bit surreal I remember this uh, there was this one summer Cristiano Ronaldo was there for I think nine or ten months you know and then the season kind of ended and he, he you know he, he left that summer and he was he wasn't this big machine you know he was he was like a, a thin like kind of young teenager as it was and he come back after that summer and he looked like he'd just grown it was crazy and then even seeing that you know you're looking at that and you're thinking that's where I need to kind of get to. That's the kind of level, do you know what I mean? That was, I remember that that summer, I, that whole season, I just absolutely smashed the gym because of what I seen in him. Really? Just didn't get out of the gym all summer, yeah. And do you ever remember getting any words of advice or guidance from any of those players you've just uh, referenced? Yeah, there was, I mean, there was, there was a few times where they, you know, they'd, they'd pull you. Uh, I remember we played uh, when we was in the reserves and that, and Danny Welbeck, Danny Welbeck was like a real, like he's still obviously a really good footballer, but he was uh, he was highly thought of in the team, and you know quite a lot of the first team and stuff would help him. Especially Rio was was really close with Welbs, uh, and then you know you'd get you know people like Fletch and stuff would give you like a nudge and be like you know you need to get your head down here and and kind of crack on because you're not too far away from where you need to be, which is obviously you know as a young player you absolutely love that, love it. And what about Ferguson? Like, he's famous for his man management. Yeah. What is there any sort of examples you can give of his? Uh, I, think, I mean, I had a few. I had a few dealings with Sir Alex. To be honest, he was. I remember there was a few. Maybe, wow, we was. Uh, so for some reason, I always got proper close with like the chefs at the clubs, and I, you know, I love my food and I love cooking and all that. So just naturally, 
Uh, and I remember I was waiting for this uh, spaghetti bolognese, what Mike, the chef at United at the time, used to do fresh. And I was like, buddy hell, Mike, any chance? <laughs> Next minute, <laughs> running back at me. And I was like, what the? <laughs> and then he's like, you dare speak to him like that again? And I was like, oh. And he's like, apologize. And then Mike, the chef's like behind the oven, like, <laughs> I'm like, sorry, mate. <laughs> he's like, I thought so. <laughs> wow, that's uh, valuable, though, isn't it? Oh, it's stuff you remember. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like, you know, at the, at the time as a young kid, you're probably thinking, look, you look like, you know, you, but then when you get older, you're like, wow, that taught me so much. No, I learned so much just being around the building. I thought it was it was a great place to like, to grow older, for sure. And you ended up on the bench for the first team. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, so close yeah, to being was. a Manchester United player. <laughs> but you must have believed the night you sat on the bench, how old would you have been that night? I think I was, it was before I went on loan, wasn't it? So maybe 18, 18, I think, yeah. So you must have allowed yourself to dream that, like, this is going to happen. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, just as a club in general, it allows that. You know, you, you go previous and then you look at what happened with, like, you know, Gaznev, David Beckham, like, Paul Scholes, Nicky Butt, like, that generation. That almost creates that reality because it, it's happened. So being around them growing up, you know, it, it felt that much more real, I think. So how and when was the news broken to you that, it wasn't going to happen for you at United. Yeah, it was. It was twenty one. I remember. I remember. I was so I went through all the, like that kind of loan kind of structure that that's really beneficial as a player as well at a young age. Uh, and yeah, I was about twenty one, and I think it was when I had a couple of unsuccessful unsuccessful loans that didn't really go like to plan. And then uh, I was at Barnsley, which I absolutely loved. Loved that club. And then. Uh, Leicester came in for a bid and then United kind of like were saying I think it's time and I was like well you know I'm not, I can't say no so I guess to just move on So when you went to these loans as a young lad it must have felt like a bit of a culture shock what was it that, that you struggled with? Uh, I think it was I think a part of it was how physical it was it was you know, like I said, I was I was tiny for till I was like, I mean, I was I was still a kid when I was 18, 19 years old. I was I had nothing on me. I was like a I was like a chicken bone. It was... So the day that you have to pack up your stuff and leave and go to Leicester, there's obviously an element of like, I've been bought by another club. I'm wanted. You know, I'm going to have a career. But it's also like that dream of year after year just fighting to become a Manchester United player had gone. Was that moment? Difficult, like, did you fight and sort of say, no, look, I can make it as a United player, give me another season, or did you just accept the club's decision? No, I think I, I, think I just accepted it. I think, I think I had no choice, to be honest. I think if I was to... I think if, if the club was to say no to the offers, I think that, you know, you kind of got something behind you then to really, like, get your teeth stuck into kind of thing. But I just think when, when a club kind of accepts an offer from another club, you know, it's... They're kind of saying, we want the money instead of you kind of thing. Did it hurt? Uh, yeah, it did, yeah, yeah definitely. Because there was there was literally no, and I remember going back now, there was no communication at all between me and the club. It was literally done between like agents, and I was like, seven, seven years? I was seven years old I was there from, 21, it's quite a long time. And it was, it was nothing like, thanks, or like, well done, good luck, and all that, at the time. You know, so it was, it was a bit... Yeah, it was almost it was a bit deflating for sure. Maybe your first lesson at that moment about how brutal. Well, the exactly. World of I think it was. Is. I think it was, mate. Yeah, because I mean, you go you go from being protected so much at United to then like kind of you know there you go, kind of deal with it. But you, you do get taught really good things along the way. I'm not saying they left me like to the dogs. Do you know what I mean? Like we did get we did get taught so much things. But what was the moment when you felt like I'm on my own here? It was it was a feeling of not having that safety net. Well, look, it turned into the the best time of your career. I'm sure you wouldn't argue with that. Let's talk about how special and magical those few years were at Leicester. Yeah. When you reflect on it now, you've got that sort of great power of hindsight to actually look back properly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What was the magic? Definitely, the team bond was unbelievable. And then I'd probably say me personally, I'd probably say balance, like. I've never felt so like balanced on and off the pitch during my time at Leicester than ever before. And Explain what you mean by that, Dan. Uh, I'd probably just things like I mean, you look at all the opposites, you know, 
like I was I was confident when, when I got through that first period at Leicester after that I, I was just full of confidence I wasn't arrogant I was just confident and then on the pitch I was you know I was this communicator but I would never like overstep the communication where I'd maybe make someone feel like a bit shit you know and then off the pitch I had like I was in like a a long-term relationship but then I would also enjoy time with a lot everything was just kind of felt right all felt dead easy uh but I think I think balancing everything really it was just it was just a nice it was just everything felt like such nicely timed for that kind of for that finish it just yeah it's hard to really put into words and when you reflect on that time what is the you know, for a lot of people, it would just be like the trophy lift was the famous yeah. moment when you won the Premier League. What do you look? What do you remember though as a moment that kind of summed up what that what that club did for you and why it was so special? Uh, I'd, I'd probably say a bit of everything. It was, it was. You know, we won the championship. We nearly got relegated the season after, first season in the Prem, and then the the second year in the Prem, we go on and win it. Like if you look at them as three years in football, it's it's just untouchable. I don't think you're going to get that. And then even the year after that, we got to the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Yep. It's not it's not something that happens all the time. That so when um, Pearson gets sacked, that's yeah. the first time that you've obviously lost the manager, if you like, it, yeah. uh, at a club. So what was the reaction to his sacking? But equally, what was the reaction when you heard that Ranieri was coming in? Having uh, Claudio Ranieri come in it was a huge name and he'd managed some massive clubs so I think you know me included and the lads were like bloody hell like the owners are really having a go here like you know we've just kind of scraped it in the prem like this is a big sign this and what was he like as a manager I was wicked was absolutely it? wicked yeah I loved him I used to call him a granddad honestly he, tr he treated him like a grandson it was it was just unbelievable like if there was if there was anything I ever needed, even like an extra day off because something that maybe had happened off the pit, he'd, he'd be like, no problem, drinks. Just make sure you look after yourself kind of thing, look after your family, whatever, and then just come back the day after and make sure you're good to go. And he, he was, for me, he was exactly what I needed at exactly the right time. It's interesting that because, you know, a lot of footballers and a lot of managers will infantile the players. Mm. Set rules, can't bend them, can't break them. I'm in charge, you're not. Whereas it feels like someone giving you a little bit of control or a little bit of autonomy so was... Yeah, goes such a long way. I remember, I mean, you can you can look at it when you don't get that. You know, when you don't get that, you almost feel like you're just one of 30 players. But when you do get it, you know, it's safe. As, as a manager, like, player management is so important. I've, had, I've been managed really well as a player and I've been managed, like, really bad as a player and 100% you get the best out of the player when you managed well personally, 100%. And when did you know or believe you were going to win the Premier League? I've always said it was City away. I remember that game and it was, we didn't we didn't get dominated and luckily score three goals. We kind of dominated the game and kind of battered him. And in the dressing room afterwards, I remember like, fucking hell lads, like this is, this is our chance this. If it's ever meant to be like, it's never going to get much easier than this for us. Could you believe it was happening? That all these wow. so-called big teams were yeah. just struggling and there you were. Yeah. No, I think, <clears throat> I think again, the timing of everything, you know, having that like, we were like on fire as a team and then other teams weren't probably fulfilling their potential kind of thing. So I think, you know, I think if, if we was on fire and City was on fire, City going to win it. But because, because of like you said, how the other teams were kind of struggling and we were like marching on, I just thought, you know, if there's ever a time, it's now. But if you could pinpoint the difference then between the season before where, like you say, you've nearly got relegated to go into City and dominating them, mm -hmm. what was the difference? I think going through what we went through, so that relegation thing and like coming out of it right at the end, I think the momentum of that going into the new season massively helped us. Because, you know, we, we've, we've almost like flirted with what the possibility was of going back to the championship. And I think that was like a strong feeling for quite a lot of us. And then starting the new season in the Prem, it was like, we're staying in the Prem. There's no two ways about it. Like, we need to do everything we can to to make sure we stay in the Prem. And then, you know, you win a game, you win a game, and then 
it's like shit. So what was it? So momentum's a really interesting word that lots yeah. of people listening to this will hear about, but say, well, what is it and how do I use it to my advantage? What does momentum look like from your point of view in that dressing room? Oh, it's just it's just like a it's a feel good feeling. Like when when you when you're winning games and things are going well, everything it kind of it's like you know water for ducks back kind of thing. It's just everything feels so easy. And then you know looking at it the other way, if you're losing games, everything feels so hard. You know, and then not only is it feeling hard for you, the fans are feeling it, and then the fans get on you. And then you know, it, I think it, if you in the momentum, if you're confident and you're using the confidence in the right way. You will just keep you'll just keep progressing the way you want to progress. So, give us an example of say like what the conversations were like in the dressing room during that season when you were winning it compared to when you were up against it. The oh, well, there would have been no there would have been no conversations really when we're losing it. It would have been like kicking boots about like fuck it, like the old typical like kind of angry lads. And then, I mean, after it, you know, it's, it's like anyone want a beer, lads? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like. Let's enjoy it whilst it kind of lasts and stuff. And then it just, I think it was more like that feeling of uh, probably feeling a bit more grateful. Like after the game win, you know, just beat United. I mean, well done, lads. Like buzzing, high fives everywhere. And all that kind of like that happy stuff, you know, in the car on the way home, straight to straight to the lads or have a beer or whatever. And it's just kind of, you know, it's just like I said, it's just like easy feeling. Everything felt like good. Was there no moment where it felt so close and it felt like such a big story that you all tightened up a bit? I don't think it did, no. I don't think it ever did. I think I think going towards the end of the season, I think where it got a bit more real, I think it made us a bit tired as a team. It was because then, you know, then you've got like every like Leicester fans wanted us to win it. But then you've also got like other football team fans kind of rooting for the underdog. And it was a bit like, okay, you know, like this is good, this. Is there any part of you that's thinking about Manchester United and the fact they let you go at that point? Yeah, there was definitely a part, 100%. There was definitely a like, almost relief. There was obviously like relief that we've just done it finally. And it personally for me, it was like, you know, somebody's let me go where they shouldn't let me go. I can still, I can still do what I know I can do. It was a huge trophy, but then, you know, that, that summer window... There was there was a few of the big clubs like knocking on the door wanting to take me and I was like, listen, I want to kind of see this through with Leicester. You know, I want winning Champions League like it's a journey. Like I want to still be a part of it. So, I think I think then it was more like my focus was mainly on Leicester and seeing what we can achieve again. I didn't want I didn't want to I didn't want to disappear then from Leicester. I wanted to carry on. Of course, the one thing that is bigger than club football is international football. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this was the time that the moment came where you got an England call up. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? No, that was mad. That was the first call up because it was it was getting talked about quite a bit, and you know why is he not in the squads and all that stuff. But I didn't really pay too much attention, so I was trying not to. Uh, and I think, I think when I did, it was like probably equaled equaled the feeling of lifting a trophy for me. Wow, really? Yeah. Was, How did you find out? Uh, we was training on the pitch, and it was it was obviously before the training session. The lads and that, you know, it's like it was like, ah, oh, drinks gonna get cold up, and I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, like leave it. You got no chance. Like it's got to train, kind of thing. And then the kit man, uh, Macca at the time, at Leicester ran out, drinks, drinks, you're in the squad. And then kind of training stopped, and that everyone just buzzing, you know, high fives everywhere, and that didn't really sink in. And then when I got home, told my dad, and yeah, probably the first time I've seen him cry, to be honest. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's nice, man. Yeah, it was really good. Well, so he didn't. He wasn't as emotional when you won the league. No, 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 no. That England call up for him, I think, was like the big, the big thing. And what did that do for you? Oh yeah, it made it's mad in it validation, everything. Like you know, like wow, finally made him proud, kind of thing. And then you go from, you know, you go from win the league to like getting your England call up, and it's like, this is what I've worked kind of so hard for. And what was it like when you turn up for your first? Yeah, it was David mad. England. It was mad. I remember, uh, I mean, it wasn't the time when, like, you know, there was Steven Gerrard's, Frank Lampard's, and John Terry's. It, it wasn't that time, but still had, like, unbelievable players who I looked up to for, like, the majority of my career. And that okay. was, I mean, you look at, like, Gaz Cahill, there was James Milner, you know, 
players I've played with like throughout England levels, schoolboy, that I was now playing in the first team with. That was like a, that was really good, man. It was like that that first, the first England period for me was, I was like, I was kind of chuffed with myself. They have interesting people to select that as fellow players that you looked up to. Yeah. What was it about Gary Cahill or James Milner, for example, that... I just think it was the head? whole, like, the whole career they've had. Guys kind of come from, you know, Sheffield lad, like, played for Bolton. Kind of, not not similar kind of starts in the career, but, you know, they've never always been at a massive club. They've kind of drove themselves to where they kind of are now. James Milner kind of thinks similar. Yeah. Uh, so I just think... I just think the you know the actual graft and how professional they both were and and a few things really you know the majority of players there are, are absolutely class. Harry Kane was at loan at Leicester for a period when I was there and like you know look what he's gone on to achieve. It's it's just it's, you know it's good to be a part of. So Leicester was a fairy tale. Yeah. England wasn't. No, it wasn't. Not really. After the fourth fourth or fifth time, or maybe even less, third or fourth time, the kind of you know the the shine kind of comes off a bit and the kind of reality hits and that and I, you know I wasn't really playing I remember my debut got my match on my debut and I was thinking fucking like I'm flying like buzzing when's the next one you know and then I went to the next one didn't really play and then I was like scratching my head got cut from the Euros and I was like scratching my head again thinking like so what's going on we, let's talk about the Euros yeah, course, cut. Yeah. I mean because that was sort of felt from the outside especially brutal how did it feel for you yeah it was it was I didn't expect it at all it was the I mean I remember I remember when they brought Jack Wilshire into the squad for the. So it was it was that first. We had like a training camp before it, and I know I know Jack. I've played with him in the school boys. He's an unbelievable player, unbelievable. When he was brought in, I kind of knew that, and I kind of thought this is a, he's not played all season. Like, what's this about? And then, you know, we we go like a week into the training kind of schedule, and you, you get a feeling, but I still didn't think it'd happen. How would you get a feeling? Just just because, like, you know. Th- in, in like shape say in training you know he'd be in the shape or uh, sounds daft or like you know the players who kind of they prioritise might be getting asked to do a bit more so you know you, as, a, as a player you do get feelings around around certain things and then and do you try and fight that and sort of think right I need to get my elbows out here I've got to yeah I mean yeah, yeah for sure yeah I mean if 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 you get caught in that position, you can either go one or two ways. You know, you can either like you know roll your sleeves up, or you can just kind of kind of agree to it. Uh, and I think no matter what you do, sometimes the decision's already been made. And I think that was just one of them positions. And so yeah, Roy Hodgson and Gary Neville there at the yeah. time. Now you've obviously got the relationship with Gary from yeah. your days at United. So what what were they saying to you during this period? Uh, not much, to be honest. There wasn't there wasn't like a lot of uh, personal interaction to do with the game. It, you know, it was obviously you have banter and all that stuff, whatever. But it wasn't like you know, do this a bit more, and you're gonna hundred percent be on the plane. There was none of that. It was just right. you know, I don't know if that'd get seen differently off other people. Maybe I don't know. That's why they probably didn't do it. I'm not sure. But it was never like you know, just do this a bit more, do that, do that a bit less. You know, and we'll get you through. Like you're gonna make it, yeah. Kind of thing. It was none of that. So, if you loved Ranieri, yeah, how was the relationship with Roy? Nowhere near the same. Bearing in mind, you know, you with England maybe four or five days every. I think at the time it would have been like two months. So you don't you don't get that constant, like Monday to Saturday kind of relationship. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, the treatment was different for sure. In what way? Well, I mean, I'd, I wouldn't call Roy Otten my granddad. I'd call Claudio Ranieri my granddad. I just don't think we probably enjoyed each other's characters as much as what me and Claudio possibly did. And so how do they break the news that you're... Well, it was a phone call to the room. So it was oh. like, yeah, it was mad, honestly. So before before we disappear off off duty kind of thing, it was, right, everyone go back to your rooms and then we'll call a meeting in like an hour. Sound... And then the phone rings, and then I was like, "Who rang?" Roy, and I was like, "I know who this is." So I answered, "Aya," and then it was obviously Roy. Yeah, yeah, I'll come. He wanted me to go to his room, so I was like, "Yeah, yeah no problem. Come down." And on the way down, I was like, "I know I'm caught." 
So then we obviously just, we spoke. Nothing like, you know, I think it was about this and this. It was just, we're going to take, we just decided with Jack instead of you. Uh, you've had an unbelievable season kind of thing. Don't let it kind of get to you. Go and enjoy your summer. So I was like... And you said... <laughs> sound. I mean, there's not much you can do. There's literally not much you can do. You can, you know, you can kick up a fuss and that, but it's not going to change anything. So did you? No, no, literally shook his hand, said thanks, walked out and then straight on the plane. And what's going on for you when you're walking out of that room? No, I was obviously good. I was good, but... I mean... I was on such a high from the season before, there's no chance that I was going to let that affect me. No chance. You know, and then obviously when when it kind of, you know, when you come off your old days and you're watching the team and then it's like, the fuck? Like, I should be there. I should be trying to help them. But, you know, it's been, it's been taken out of your hands. You can't, you have no input in it. You can't do anything. And I remember watching it and I was like, fucking hell. Can't believe this. That would be the closest I've like, the closest I've got to possibly playing in the Euros, hundred percent. And it's just been taken away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What's interesting is like you spoke about Claudio Ranieri, and yeah. it wasn't big things he was doing to build that relationship. So, was there some small things that you think? Uh, yeah, they could have done that better. Or I mean, with me personally, it was a bit. It was. It felt almost a bit prisony, like international football. You know, you'd go. You'd go to St. George's Park and you'd be in St. George's Park for five, four, five, six days, whatever. And you're literally stuck in the hotel. Like, I live an hour away from that. So, I don't know, to get the best out of each player, could could you not give them the option of maybe living in at home and travelling in? I don't know. Possibly. I mean, I used to travel further to Leicester. So that, to me, was like walking a park. You You need freedom, don't you? I like freedom. I, yeah. th I feel like for me as a person, you get the best out of me when you just, you know, you just say, just do what you want, just make sure you're ready kind of thing. Well, let's move forwards then. So the England thing happens, you yeah. go back to Leicester, you get to the quarterfinals of the Champions League, amazing. I'd love to know how you first heard of Chelsea's interest. It was, yeah, it was the season after we won the Prem. So I was, I was aware of that through the whole summer. There was, I think it was through my agent and stuff, there was quite a lot of contacts. Uh, and the N'Golo County deal happened and they had a bit of a falling out between the clubs over the deal. So then they kind of come back and was like, listen, we still want to get this done. You know, but the relationships kind of fell off between us and Leicester. And I was like, listen, I'm, I want to stay for this for this Champions League thing anyway. Let's, well, you know, we revisit it or whatever. Uh, and then the January window come and we were still in the Champions League so I was like I'm not I'm not leaving this there's just no chance and then obviously I think it was, was it February I think we might have fell out of the Champions League so I think then from from coming out of the Champions League to the end of the season at Leicester it was always a bit like I, 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 felt, I felt imbalanced do you know what I was saying before about my yeah. balance and like I felt then it was a bit of an imbalance and I knew, I kind of knew I was going to Chelsea. So then having that in my head, you know, I'd, I still 100% concentrate on Leicester. Like I'd never like not, but and I knew I was going that window and it was just, it was just really hard work to get out. Really hard work. How do you mean? It wasn't done in the right way for me. It got, it got a bit like, it got a bit silly really. Can you give us an example? I mean, just, like, I had to, like, the director would be in meetings and I'd have to barge in and, like, try and cause a scene just to get an answer out of him. Do you know what I mean? It shouldn't have been like that. It should have been, like, thanks. Just just sit tight. We just want this much. Just be patient. It's going to happen. That's how I would have liked it to have gone. But, you know, it was just, it just got a bit silly. So when you barge in, what, what are you saying? Well, just the typical angry little Danny Arna. Get a fucking deal done. What's going on? <laughs> and they say, "I'm in a meeting. Like what? What? Get a fucking deal done." And it was just, it was just silly. It was just getting daft. And then I remember uh, even even Riyadh's got a bit. You know, it was it was never it was never easy getting out. I mean, it never is really getting out of a club, to be honest. And it's not one I wanted to leave. It's just I had to leave. I knew uh, I knew like that had kind of completed its journey, and 
there was no chance I was missing out on this opportunity. So it just it just needed to happen, and it was just it was just a shame the way it did. And do you think you managed to influence what happened in the end? Hundred percent. Yeah. So the deal happens. Deal happens. They don't want an angry Danny staying at Leicester. So no, no. Do you think that? Do you think they, maybe they thought that? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I mean, going back to my United days, I honestly I used to be. I remember Ollie Warren Joyce, uh, and a few of the reserve managers. I think we're in that Mick Phelan. I think we're in the meeting at that time, and they were like, "Are you sure? Like, this is what you want to do? Play football?" I was like, "What do you mean?" Yeah, don't know. What, don't know what else I'm gonna do. You just seem like so angry all the time. Oh right, okay. <laughs> they couldn't see you nah, the enjoyment no, that you were nah, getting. No, no, but I, it was just it was just my way of expressing as a young kid. You know what I mean? And what did that do for you? I mean, I'd like to say it fired me up. I'd like to say it made sure I didn't do the mistake again. You know, it was my way of learning, kind of thing. But if I could look at it a different way, hundred percent, I would have done. I just didn't have the tools to do it. You know, I just didn't. I just didn't know how to speak kindly to myself to then learn from kind of like a bad pass or like a you know a crap shot or a bad touch or something. You know, it was always like fuck's sake, come on, you, what are you doing? It's kind of my reaction to stuff. And did you have the tools at Leicester t- before you got angry to try and have like a civil conversation first? With myself? No. No. You just, you went. It, to- it was just like zero to 10, pretty much. Yeah. Where like, you know, good, like, so if I was doing all the good passes, all the right passes, and then I wouldn't be like, well done, mate. Like, well done. I would, it would just be like. Oh, so you wouldn't give yourself the pat on the back? No, nah, not really, no. Nah. It was, I, I don't know why. Looking back now, I'm, I'm thinking like, like, why didn't you? Like, <clears throat> some, of you, some of your stuff you used to do, mate. You used to be class. So where does that come from then? My dad's exactly the same. If not, me on steroids, like, he's so bad with it. So it, my dad's like, uh, he works in labour, like he's a building trade. But honestly, like, if you listen to him trying to fix the radiator, you'd be thinking a bomb went off. <laughs> and it's like, what the fuck am I listening to here? And was he tough with and you that's... as a lad? Uh, yeah, yeah. But not, nothing out of the ordinary? No, nothing, no, nothing yeah. out of the ordinary. No, I just, you know, I think it was just, again, like, I don't think he had the tools to, to know how to deal with things differently. And I think I just kind of, like, picked up on stuff kind of on the way through. So you, so you, as a father now yourself, yeah. what would you do differently than what your dad did for you when you're watching your lad play football? Oh, everything, everything different. I've, to be honest, I've, <clears throat> with my little man, I've, I don't even think I've, I don't even think a little part of me has been, like, you know, pushing him into football, kind of like, do what you want to do, mate. Do what you want to do. So what, you're trying to get out of Leicester, right? Were you able to use these tools, to like positive tools to get out, or did you go straight to the angry Danny as soon as you thought the deal wasn't no, going to happen? No, I remember, uh, I remember going to speak, because it was, it was Craig Shakespeare at the time with the manager, yeah. and I, like, I love Shakey. Like, you know, we got along like an house on fire. He was such a good guy. Uh, and I remember going to him saying, Shakes, listen, like, you know, this needs to happen. Gutted, it's underneath you. I don't want to leave you. But, you know, the opportunity is just too good. I just, it's been sat there for a bit. I can't, I can't not go. And, you know, and then, he, then we kind of talk as people, you know, are you sure you'll be happy in London? Kind of thing. And then it's like, yeah, I think I'd love it, to be honest. And then it's like, you know, you kind of look at it from outside of football. And, he, and then he, he'd be like, I don't know what they're going to do, drinks, to be honest. But, you know, just be patient, maybe. And I'm like, there's not much I can do with that shakes. You know, I, I kind of, this needs to happen. This might sound a silly question because I, I get moving to Chelsea is exciting, but what was it for you? Was it the idea of getting to that top four club that you had at, from United or was it the financial incentive? What was it that was no, driving it, you it to be that, so desperate? It was that, that burning in the background getting back to a top four. It was me... It was me wanting to prove people wrong again. Like, United told me, like, but I'm going to get back there, don't worry about that. Obviously, listen, the finances are great. Like, you know, you're getting put, you was on so much and then you're getting put on this much. Yeah. Why Why are you not going to get excited about that? But it was It was always about uh, that top four, yeah? And being, like, regular Champions League, like, Europa Cup, all them big tournaments, it was all about that. Yeah. So should we talk then about life at Chelsea? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, you know, people will make that assumption. 35 million quid, whatever yeah. was paid for you. Phenomenal wages, living in London, back at a top club. What was the reality of that move like? 
Uh, I mean, as as a whole, it was obviously, you know, it was garbage. But you know, if you break it down, I had some unbelievable times there. Not unbelievable, but like you know, really good times. So I mean, it, the first day was madness. Like literally, it was left left Leicester. Deal hadn't been done, and it, from what I know, I don't think Leicester planned to get it done. Drove down, sat down there with my agent and a, and a few other people. Was in like a hotel for majority of the day, and then we got an extension on the deadline because it was never done in time. Uh, oh, it's funny. I got. I remember. So uh, Michael Lemon all at the time. We've, you know, he's like. Bear in mind, I think it was like one, two o'clock in the morning. He was the director of football at Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. And then he's like, you know, shouting down the corridor, "Let's get this deal done," and all this. And I'm sat there thinking, "Fucking, you know, what's going on?" And anyway, we get the extension and signed it and all that. And Michael's still in his office, so I've, I've walked down like sheepish and not like put like a face on. Mike's like, "Not got the deal done. It's not been done." He's like. Fucking what? <laughs> and I've gone, way! <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, jinx, you dickhead. So I'm like, no, it's all done. Like, obviously buzzing then. Yeah, I bet. So did, you have a, so did you have a conversation with the manager uh, before no, this? No, uh, only, only previous on the phone. Never met him. What did he but say? I've seen him, I've seen his work in the season and I'm all over it. I'm thinking, wow, this guy's a genius. And like tactically, like he looked, he looked like way better than anything else I've ever seen right uh, but it was more about like when, we, when we'd when we speak it'd be more about you know I'm excited to get you at the club you know you kind of look like the player that'll slide right in and all the right things so when when do you think things first started no longer going right at Chelsea uh, so I mean the first season was a bit tricky you know I picked up like three or four niggly little injuries that were just I mean, it's just part of football, really. Yeah. You can't really point any things like that. Was there any part of you that was acting like was acting differently? Because you know you've been a great pro to this point. Were you suddenly earning loads of money, out on the lash, having a f- bit of fun in London, not fully focused on your football? Like, had you changed? Oh, in that in the second season, hundred percent. Not in the first season. No, no, I was. So you arrived and you were. I was on it. Yeah, I was. I was dying to get going. It was never the fee that bothered me. That was like, that's just separate. It was more like, I need to prove myself again now. You know, I've I've ticked a box by getting back to a top four. Now I need to stay there kind of thing and, you know, prove to myself, not about anyone else, it's myself now. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you kind of, you get the injury, you know, it's like, right, okay, go again, come back. And then it was literally, at the end of that season, like with, with Chelsea, it was just, I had this one moment that like, disappointed me massively and can't say too much, but, Hopefully, you know, in the future, it's going to get solved, the kind of thing. But uh, that summer, after that, I was like, I need to go. This just isn't for me. This is, it's just not. It's not really worked from the get go. And then this has happened, so I could do with going here. This isn't going to go any better. And I remember in that first seat, I moved. I like I bought a big house to move all my family down, all my, like, my dogs, everything, have a good go of it. And I was ready to just like, forget about that and just go where I needed to get. Just so like, my career would kind of not go the way it's gone. So you, you had to get out? I was I was trying to leave that first window. I appreciate the confidences, but what was it? Was it a personal or was it a professional thing? No, no, thing? it was, I mean, I can't say too much yet, I don't think, but it was... It was to do with the club, yeah. Mm. So basically, you've arrived at Chelsea. Yeah. The very first opportunity to leave, you feel you need to go. Yeah. And to this day, you're unable to tell people what no, it, it was. No, it wasn't. It was... Bef- so what I can't say happened before I wanted to go. So it was It was me then thinking, like, this is it's just not for me. Like, I need to go. So that was previous. And now in the summer, I'm trying to leave. And then... Uh, my agent saying, "Listen, like they're not letting you go. You, to get in another manager in, stick around. She's she's not letting you go. Stick around." So I'm like, what "The fuck, right? Okay. Like, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm making out like you know, me staying at Chelsea is a really bad thing. It's still a great thing, but when you get a feeling, I kind of I knew it wasn't going to go the way I wanted it to go." But it was just out of my hands at that point. And if you were able to tell people now what had happened, would they have a, 
a greater understanding of, think so. of what happened afterwards so, yeah. and why things got so difficult. Possibly, yeah. It'd make more sense. So although we can't talk about that moment yeah. specifically, you can tell us the impact it had on you. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it kind of, I mean, you can see the impact. You can, I mean, the season after, didn't play a single minute. And then from then it was kind of, you know, that's when we go back to what you were saying a second ago where I'd I'd get stuck into the London City life. You know, I'd, I'd be partying way more than what I kind of want to do. And my focus wasn't on football for the first time. And you use that term balance quite a few times. Mm. So it sounds now that things have gone completely, oh, yeah, completely. <laughs> out of balance. And I'm interested in who was around you to remind you of that balance or to help you try and find a, a better place. I mean, it was more, it was probably me, to be honest, looking in the mirror kind of thing. It wasn't, it wasn't coming externally. You know, I'd, I'd be going into training knowing I wasn't playing. And sometimes, not even training, it was it was so strange. Like I'd go to training and I'd be doing fitness on my own whilst the lads were training. And I've I've never been in that position in my life. And I was like, what is going on here? This is so foreign to me, this. And it's like, the fuck? I've I've I'm I'm here to play football, not to like, you know, I'm not an athletics runner. Like, get me on the pitch. Didn't you try and have a conversation with the club and say, listen? Let's just sort this out. Like this isn't working for anybody. Mm. At the start, I did. So it was it was Sari, and he was a great guy, by the way. And we got along top. It was so strange. Like we got along top. I just don't think we seen eye to eyes. I don't even know if it was from him. Looking back now, but you know, I was given I was given an hour to like find an English club, and I was like, what are you "How do you mean?" So we had we had the meeting. He pulled me into his office. This is like said like an hour before the window closes. This is under Sarri now. Under Sarri, yeah. And Gianfranco's always in there. He was again a really nice guy. Uh, and we're, we're talking, just having chat. And then he goes, "We need to let's talk serious kind of thing." Uh, you know, I, you, I think you're gonna get frustrated with, the, with your playing time this season. I'm like, "What? Where's this? Like, you know, they just signed Jorginho kind of thing, which is fair." Uh, but I, you know, I'd been a part of his preseason plans and stuff. I was always playing games. I was like, what? Well, where's this come from? And then John Franco, and I was like, I ain't, you know, I ain't. I've got an hour. Like, what's going on? Like, no, no, like, you know, there's load of Italian clubs that. Well, what the fuck? I've just had a, I've just had a kid. Like, I ain't going can anywhere. So what do you want me to do? He's like, oh. So I was like, what the fuck? So I just walked out. It was a difficult one that because I was in a position there where you know, first of all, it was a surprise. And then secondly, it's going, it's going way against what I wanted. So then it's like, do I just, do I just go to Italy and or go to Spain in the leagues? And then I'm like, nah, man, my priority is my kid. Like, you've got no chance. Like, this is this is all changed now. I'm I'm st sticking in. I'm this is me. I'm settling here. There was talk of Cesc going at the time. But then, you know, he stayed, Jorginho came in. So I knew it would be hard work. I, listen, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. But I did not want to become a part of that loan market that Chelsea's got. It was just never in my plans when I joined, ever. So what did you do? You've walked out of the office, you've decided that I'm, I'm going to stay here. Yeah. How did you go about resetting expectations? If you did. Yeah, I think, I think a part of me did. A, a part of me didn't want to let it go, though. It was... I was literally going in training and my mindset totally changed. So like I, I'd, where in the past I'd go into training and I'd be 100% on it every day. I'd be grafting, I'd be probably, I'd like to say I'd work just as hard as the hardest person on the pitch, you know, but I'd have my off days where I'd get pissed off or whatever, like natural. Uh, but I was now going into training just to keep people entertained. Like I'd, I'd go in and be like, on the drive in, I'd be like, right, drinks, just fucking, just don't be a today kind of thing. Just be a nice guy. Like, don't let it piss you off too much. You know, if you can make people laugh. Did you feel you'd been forced into this? You know, football's controlled by transfer windows anyway. So I knew as soon as this one went, I had another four or five months until January. So it was like, just get on with it. And then that window come and I was like, you know, I didn't have a schedule with my son at the time. It was still all over the place with, you know, custody kind of thing. But I was still not willing to to go to then mess that up even more because that was my priority. 
So, you know, it was, I think it was taken out of my hands. I didn't have, there's nothing really that I could have done better at that stage. What do you reflect on as the lowest point? I'd probably say that season, yeah. Yeah. Not a specific moment or anything? Uh, I wouldn't say, it was, I, th I just think <clears throat> the whole season was just tough. It was so hard. Because then, you know, I've got things happening off the pitch and then things are not happening how I'd like to on the pitch. And, and you know, we talk about, we said about balance again, like yeah. if you're getting, if, the, if shit hits the fan off the pitch, but it's going good on the pitch, it's almost like that. You can kind of juggle it a bit. Whereas if both are like all over the place, you you just don't know how to like react to anything. It was it was a strange position. And what came first? Was it the off the field problems you think precipitated what went on on it, or was it the other way around? I don't think it was one or the other. I just think, I just think at the time, you know, like that was the club's decision and the manager's decision, and then this is kind of happening, and it just kind of all like fitted in where I just didn't know really how to how to manage myself because we had a conversation with Jordan Henderson mm. who spoke about again almost lacking the tools to be able to handle some of the professional challenges who was coming home and he almost wouldn't open up to his wife and that created yeah. issues that he eventually managed to resolve and I'm interested in what what this professional situation was doing for you, going home and dealing with some of the challenges you were facing? Uh, I mean, I, I was a single lad in London at the time. So I was, you know, without getting too much detail away, I was like, I was being a single lad in London. I was getting stuck into living in the, living in the city. I was, I was trying to, I was trying to enjoy that side of life as a kind of, as a kind of cover for everything else, basically. You know, I, that's what I'd use to kind of enjoy myself because everything else was going pretty shitty. Yeah. You know, you look back now and it was, you know, I'd, I'd be going out drinking, I'd be, you know, single, like I said, so I'd be getting older like any bird I kind of can and it was just mad. It was just, it was just not It was just not me as a focused footballer, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And people will look at this and go, you're earning huge money. Yeah, it means... You're a huge football club. Yeah. You don't even have to go to work. You can just be your own guy, you're in the capital of England and you're single, you must have been having a great time. What is the reality? I mean, it's, it does sound great, to be fair. It sounds great. But when, but when everything's not going right and you've got that, that is irrelevant. It, it's secondary, like earning the wage is absolutely pointless. It doesn't mean a thing. I think anyone, I think anyone thinking earning a good amount of money is going to solve all your problems is just it's just not true at all you know and then you've got like you're playing for Chelsea you're earning all that money like you said you know but like no nah, I'm like I'm not playing for Chelsea yeah I'm earning money kind of thing but I'm not playing I'm not I'm not earning it how I want to earn it for me it's a kick in the bollocks really and then you get you get that side of it where you know you, you're waking up with like a hangover and then it's like fuck kind of last night's, you know, happiness has kind of disappeared and stuff and it's back to reality. And then you're going like, right, I've got to go into training now and not kind of train. So I'm not getting like that enjoyment out of work. I mean, I'm trying to put it into perspective for people. So I mean, imagine like, you know, you're going, let, you go into an office job maybe and then you go into the office and it's not a place where you want to be because the people you're working with, not working with, working for. Don't want you. Don't want you. Exactly, don't want you. But you're going in there, you're putting on a brave face and you're trying to make the best of it. How unhappy were you? Yeah, I was unhappy, man, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I, I loved certain parts of it. Like, oh, outside wow. of football, I loved it. But as soon as, as soon as I was in the car on the way in, I was like, fuck. But we always have high agency, right, over our lives. We always can decide how we react to certain yeah, course, situations. Yeah. You know, no one else was making you go out and drink and have a great time and everything else, right? So 
why were you not able to just press stop on this and go, right, the best thing for me is to still be as professional as possible? Uh, I mean, I'd like to think I was, to be honest. Like, I know, you know, I'm, I was drinking and doing all that stuff that we've discussed, but I'd, I'd still go into training and I'd make sure I, I was as good as I could be for the lads. That was that was my only way I could be professional around the place. It wasn't, you know, when they go on and win the Europa League that year, and I'd like to think, you know, me being a bit of a clown around the place in the day kind of helped them. Uh, but, but you got arrested and charged yeah, with drink yeah. driving. No, there, there was times where that's not no taking there, control of no, your life. No, accountability is massive for me. I mean, that was a massive wake up sign for me, like massive, because I remember. I was in the I was in the cell for I think it was twenty three hours I was in it, and it, you know they usually take two or three hours and things, I think, <laughs> uh, and I was in there and I was obviously like I'm sobering up, and I'm in this cell, and I'm thinking, what the fuck are you doing, mate? This is not you at all. It's not you as a person. It's not how you want to be as a person. Like, you need to you need to get hold of yourself here. You know, and then that's when I started seeking outside kind of outside help with it all. So I was then speaking to like, you know, psychologists and stuff saying, listen, like something's not right here. This isn't me. Like I need kind of some direction, some something, some other focus to improve myself again. And what was the advice coming back to you from these experts? Uh, do you know... One thing that's always stuck in my head, what they've, uh, what they said was, they, they say they say about spinning plates. I mean, it's quite. I think it's quite a well known thing now. But you know, if, if you're trying to spin so many plates, there's only so many kind of like plates you can spin at once. And I was trying to spin so many at one time. It was just getting way too much. So then I think you know slowly like things started to like come together a bit, and then. And then I kind of, it kind of got a bit, everything got a bit lighter, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't going out drinking as much. I'd go out when I want to go out. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing maybe as rash things as what I was doing in the first six months. Would you mind sharing with us? Because I think it is so valuable for people to hear a former professional footballer talk about this. Um, Your mental health. I think it's huge, man. I honestly, I just, I think, I think mental health is probably more important than your physical health, to be honest. You know, you've got, you can be physically fit, but if you're not mentally well, you're going to, your body's going to break down. You know, so I think priority every day of the week should be mental health, 100%. Now, mentally unwell, were you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I was, I'm not sure if I was in the deepest hole but I was, it's, it's the darkest I've ever felt, 100%. I've never like, you know, I've always been about, I've always been the kind of personality that would like, you know, just get on with it, brush things, you know, the typical like kind of man stuff. But I mean, during that, during that stage, I just couldn't shift anything. It was like, it was almost like you're drowning a bit and you forgot how to swim. It was a strange feeling, man. It was so strange. And with an upbringing that you've had, Mm -hmm. did you feel it was your responsibility to deal with that alone? Yep. And everyone else's. They can't see it. Don't let them see it. You can't hurt them. I mean, I feel like I get a bit upset, bloody hell. So then, I mean, it makes it a bit more harder for me when family's involved. That's what gets me. Mm. How do you mean? Just the responsibility of, like, of making them possibly feel a bit shit as well. Mm. Did you feel you let them down? Yeah. So what, like, what did your mum and dad say when oh, you when I, when came I, out of the cell? I mean, they're obviously disappointed, like any parent would be. Do you know what I mean? But I think they kind of knew as well, like I wasn't being myself. So I don't think they like they didn't held it against me because they knew like I was going through. You know, from outside it looked a bit shitty, but you know they were obviously like close to me, so they kind of know it's shitty. So I just think they kind of like, you know, a bit stupid in it, Dan. Yeah, like, kind of let me go with it kind of thing. And did you tell them how hard it was? Not at, at first, no, not at first. 
no. Because I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put any responsibility on them. As, you know what I mean? Like when I think when you're going through these things, you almost like kind of bring everything in, hmm. and then you know, and then it obviously gets too much. Then it's just literally like, like it's like a flood. So I just think. I mean, I, and I've never, I've never really been through that before. I've never had to deal with it before. So this was like my first, my first low point. So I, again, I, I was, I was just a bit like, what's going on here? Like, why do I feel like, you know, loads of questions. Why do I feel like this? Why do I feel like this? How do I deal with it? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it's something I've learned off again. It's mad. So if someone was listening to this then, Danny, what would you say would be the most effective first step for when, if if they recognise they're at that low point, what did you take? Well, I, I just, I mean, talking's massive. And feeling like you can trust the person you're talking to is massive. That definitely helps. Uh, and just be kind to yourself, man. It's, you know, it's, it's not, it's never just going to be simple. Like, things may have felt simple, but it's not always going to be that way. Like, just give yourself a break, man. Just give yourself a little... Just give yourself a pat on the back when you need it kind of thing. Kindness is actually an important element to all this as well, because mm -hmm. while all this is going on, you know, there's memes on the internet about yeah. Danny Drink Water. Yeah. You're being nicknamed Danny Drink Beer, Danny Drink Cocktails. Mm -hmm. I saw... I remember seeing an ESPN article calling you the second worst Premier League signing ever. And it's like, this is someone who's suffering with their mental health, mm -hmm. having a really difficult time, and then the public pylon happens as well. Yeah. I mean, luckily for me, I've never really focused on that. You know, I've never, even when it's been going good, I've never really focused on it. But, you know, you, you see it. It obviously chips away. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of mainstream media at all. I think it's... I just think it's not a good thing. So I kind of stay away from it. But, you know, my mates look at it, my mates tell me about it. So, yeah, it's a bit like, just another thing, is it? One more thing to go with it, sound. Try and deal with that. Was there ever a point where you wanted just to talk like this almost? Yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why didn't you? At that time, I don't think, I don't think you feel like you can trust a lot of people. And then even if, even if you do, like, you know, is it going to be then put out in the right way I don't know if it is obviously a moment came for a reset right yeah Burnley yeah now the question that f people listening to this will be thinking is hold on really bad at Chelsea he gets the chance to make a move mm. goes to Burnley who wanted him because they signed him and he ends up getting in a scrap outside a nightclub yeah is this guy not learning his lessons yeah it does it looks pretty bad doesn't it so there was a few clubs and I picked Burnley because it was I could drive from home 45 minutes in the car and I could be close to my son. You know, in hindsight now, I would have gone to another club, worked under a different manager and the whole thing would have been totally different. But that's an easy thing to say, isn't it? Uh, so, again, I've worked with, I worked with Sean Dyche at Watford. He was the assistant at Watford at the time when I didn't enjoy it at all. You know, and I've gone to Burnley just hoping it'd be different. But knowing that I was close to my son. So, that was that was the main reason why I chose that club. And then going into it, I knew his teams were fully like fit. I knew they were machines. And I was like, right, that's exactly what I need. But it didn't work. It just did not work at all. Why not? I mean, he's, you know, Sean Dyche's got his own ways kind of thing. You know, you've seen loads of players go under Sean Dyche and not be successful. I think I was just one of them. For what reason? Uh, well, first of all, I wasn't playing. You know, he got he got me fit, but I wasn't playing. You know, he kind of he kind of sticks with his teams, and really, it's really really hard to get in. And then I'm in the similar position at Burnley Football Club than I was at, at Chelsea Football Club. So then, in my head, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? When I can be at Chelsea doing the exact same thing, like what is going on? And then. But bear in mind, like some of Sean Dyche's ways are wicked. Like off the pitch, he's he's class off the pitch. I like you know his meetings were brilliant. You know he's got. He, he, 
I don't know how long he's been doing it, but he's got this real thing of like the mental side of stuff. And you know, he's he's, he's class. Mm. He's class off the pitch. Uh, but then this, I mean, this Villa thing came up then, you know, and I could stay at home again. And it's another reset. Happy days, like I have to get this done. So, I, so did you? Did he kind of get rid of you because of the night? No, no, what, no, no. What, Mister? You wanted to stay, yeah, right? Mister, stay. Yeah. And what happened with that? If, 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 if that night? Uh, I can't remember much about it. To be honest, I just remember again. I was in a nightclub drinking, and then got into a little scuffle, and then got like levered by a few of them. <laughs> uh, and then I was up in the morning, and just my ankle just couldn't. I just couldn't remember what happened. Right. Went into the training ground, got it looked at, and then I've obviously like I think I've like fractured or something in my foot. Never happened to any bone in my body at all. So it's been like pretty solid. And I was like, shit, what the fuck's going on here? It was a big hiccup in in what I wanted to be like a successful loan. But I, you know, it was never like for me, it never felt like a make or break kind of moment. That right. it was a strange one, you know, because if it was like, I would have been told to leave by them. Like, he wanted to keep me, which I can't understand, to be honest, because he wasn't playing me. And I knew all, like, I think we both knew all I needed was games. All I needed was games. And then, like I said, that's when the Villa thing came up, which was massive. So you went to Villa? Went to Villa, yeah. And how did that go? The same. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, like, that's one thing I always, I, I mean, I've not, I don't think I've said this much, but... I wish that's one club I wish went different Villa because from the moment I walked in I was like it surprised me and it, it was it felt almost similar to Leicester so I was like come on like finally a club where I feel like I can kick on a bit uh, manager was Dean Smith at the time great chucked me straight in but you know probably I wasn't nowhere near ready I was miles off it to be honest uh, debut stinking Two or three games later, obviously, like still stinking. Couldn't, couldn't like I'm out of, I'm out of games now for a year and a half. So the speed feels like way too quick, and I'm thinking, fuck, like it's got away from me a bit here. So I end up doing way too much physical work than what I should be doing. Like this is myself now trying to push myself a bit too much. Uh, you know, changed my diet, went vegan, pushed myself too much physically. I mean, I'd, I'd go from a day at Villa, I was, I'd go in quite early at training, I'd swim, I'd do gym, I'd train with a team, I'd do more fitness on my own on the pitch. And then that was that was like my day then. Whereas when I'm flying, I go in training, chill out, train with a team, chill out, done. Do the odd gym session, just to make sure my muscles are firing. Other than that, that that was me. Whereas now, like I'm, I'm doing way too much, but I, I know I'm I'm trying to catch up to something, and I thought this is the way I need to do it. When it, it wasn't, it wasn't. So how did you end up headbutting your teammate? That was after the Leicester game. So I've gone back to King Power here. It's away Villa Leicester, and uh, I think we get beat like four one or something. I didn't even get on the pitch. And I'm like sat on the bench and I'm thinking, fucking hell. Like this is a place where I used to dominate like week in, week out here for a, quite a good period of time. How painful was that? That was, yeah, that was that was probably like f football in terms where I thought, I've just had enough of this. Like why am I, why am I here and not even playing? Like, I've come back, This and I love football at Leicester and I've never got it back since I left there. Which you know is is, is partly my fault, uh, and I thought, oh, I'm going back to where I love football, mint. You know, not starting fine. Mm -hmm. When I get on the pitch, fucking buzzing. I'll be flying all over the place. Didn't get on, and then <clears throat> anyone in football will tell you that the day after a game, if you've not played, they are absolute head loss sessions. So they are where like nobody's played minutes, and it's you know just to get some get some movement into your legs. And it's just not nice at all as any player. So then we're in a game and then me and the lad end up having like a little argument and then it kind of carries on and, you know, he just tells me to shut up a few two times too many and then next minute, you know, he's on the floor kind of thing. 
And as soon as as soon as I did that, I felt like shit. Because not because of what I did, but because I knew like I just knew I reacted to something where I didn't need to react to it. I should have just walked away. I just let him say his piece and walk away. Where uh, where I was in like what I felt like was such a rut that I thought, fuck no, mate, you're getting it. I should have just walked off. Should have just walked off. Had he ever done anything like that before? Uh, I mean, I've had fights and stuff. Yeah. But I've never like, I've never been told to shut up two or three times and then reacted to it. You know, I just like say something back and then whatever happens, happens kind of thing. But I'd never, no, I'd never do that. I'd never do that. From what you've said though, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost feels at this point like, you're almost seeing your career slip away now. Oh, yeah, massively. Oh, it was going. And I could feel it going. And I think that's why I was trying so hard to do all them extra bits, to try and crawl it back. Yeah. Uh, and the hard thing was as well is I knew, I knew Dean Smith was not counting on me, but I knew he thought, you know, we're going to get you back here. We'll get you back. So then you've got that additional complex layer of feeling like you're letting people down again. Yeah, yeah. I think I have, yeah. Well, I have in the background now, knowing about it. Yeah. And then even, that's when COVID came. So literally, the COVID period and the season gets extended and my loan contract runs out. And I'm, at this point, I'm saying to the gaffer and that, like, obviously, listen, I really appreciate everything. Like, sorry, I kind of let you down, but, like, I'm grateful. But I want you to know, like, I really appreciate it. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, you know, go back to Chelsea. No, no, like, we want you to stay. So I'm like, what? do you mean you want me to stay? What for? And he's like, what do you mean what for? We've got like eight massive games left or something it was. Like you're going to, you know, this is, it's a reset again. It's a massive opportunity. So I was like, gaffer man, I'm just, uh, no, I just don't want to let you down again. And then, anyway, we ended up having a conversation, I ended up signing the extension. And that was even for me, I was like, fucking hell, that's, that's good that. Like, I really appreciate that. Like, let's see what we can make of it then. What did, what did you make of it? Well, COVID came and I, I felt for the first time in two years, I was on an even playing field with the rest of the lads for fitness because I got myself into great shape and no one had played games now, I think, for like two or three months, was it? So I, f I felt like, fucking hell, like mint. And then we had a couple of friendlies. West Brom felt really good, did really good. And I felt, you know what, drinks buzzing. Made the right decision here. Thanks, Gaffer. Just sorted me right out. I'm back. Leicester away. First half of the game. Really good. Dominated again. Armstrong goes. <laughs> fucking Armstrong goes. I know. And it's like, what fucking... And then, and then it's like, what chance have I got here? Like, what chance have I actually got? And it was like a grade two, six weeks out. And then I stayed at Villa. Yeah. Stayed at Villa. It was like, the, the club were great. Got back fit. I think the lads had only played one game because it was such a tricky time when it during COVID. Uh, got back fit, first training session in with the boys. Boom, hamstring again. Same leg. And I'm like, fuck's sake, what's going on? What actually is going on? Do you know when you just, you, I just couldn't feel like I could catch a break anywhere. So then I've got, I've got me trying to get my career back on to where I need to get it or feel like I want to get it. And I'm just getting injured. So what can you do? What can you actually do? I literally felt like my hands were just, it was just everything was just out of my hands at that point. So what did you do? Uh, went back to Chelsea. Uh, went back to Chelsea and then went on loan to Turkey, Kasim Pasha, which was again brand new for me. So I'm going. I need to, this is my last chance this. I need to, I need to work at it. Went, uh, did the fitness test fine, went down in the gym the day after to do some fitness stuff on myself and my calf goes. <laughs> my calf goes. Oh, man. You jinxed. Literally, man. You must have felt jinxed. Oh, I just, and then you, and again, it's it's that thing again, like it's out on my hands. Like yeah. I've tried literally, I've tried everything. And when was, you know, that famous challenge on that kid that then went viral as well when you were playing for the under-23s. Oh, yeah. When was, was that right towards the end at Chelsea? So that, I think that was before the... Before the loan. Actually loan, yeah. yeah. I think and so. that was just frustration again. I mean, I can't, yeah, I, 
I can't remember much about it. I just remember him making a big tackle on me and then I'm just thinking, fucking little shit. Kind of just lashed out a bit. Uh, but again, you know, like made a, it was like a little kick. Like, whoopie do, man. Yeah. Whoopie do. But then, you know. But you're a story at this point. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's a, it's an easy target and that's absolutely fine. No problem. But, you know, don't, don't think I'm not like, I'm just going to take getting splattered by some little kid, like, piss off just because I'm going through it a bit. I ain't taking that. So how does it feel having gone through that with us for the last little while? Yeah, it, it sounds a bit sore, doesn't it? <laughs> like, it sounds like, you know, it's not been easy. It sounds like for yeah. someone it would be tough. You know, and, I, and this is a thing about expressing yourself. Like, when you're going through it, <clears throat> if you're expressing yourself with someone like you can talk to or trust you it does sound like it'd be hard work when you internalize things which i was doing i didn't i didn't get it myself but then when i spoke to someone it was like fuck that's that does sound like a hard time and like you know careers are careers i mean football's a short one and they do come to an end but i mean not not being able to like kind of go through it how you'd want to go through it it's kind of tough to take as well i suppose so how do you feel that you that you're almost in that position, but you're walking away from the sport now? So, like, what have you learned or that that would have served you well from when you left United, left Leicester? Now you're leaving football completely. I mean, I'd, I'd say, like, listen, it's not just about your physical state. You need to you need to prioritize your mental state. That's probably like where you should be focusing on. You know, I mean, if you look at if you look at like all the people or players or even other sports, you know, the drivers or anything that's like peak, they all they all have like a really good what what, what I'd I'd look at and say like mental state. Do you know like mm. you know, they all seem quite content or they always have some kind of stability or like balance or you know, that they're in kind of the right place mentally. So I just think if young players can get that at a young age, like that would be absolutely crucial for them in the long term. And are you at a point now where you can sit here and go, bloody hell, you know, best part of a 20 year professional career and I won the Premier League? Mm. Or do you sit here and go, that Chelsea period dominates my thoughts? I, I, I let myself down on too many occasions. Where are you at today? Yeah, no, I'd probably, I'd probably, I'd probably start with like, you've let yourself down kind of thing. Somewhere down the line a few times. You know, there's there's more than once where it's not gone to plan. But, fuck me, drinks. Like, you've you've played for England, you've won the Premier, you've won the FA Cup, you know, you've played in Charity Shields. Like, you've, you've done great. Like, you've literally done great. Mm. Like, this is, this is me coming from, you know, playing football on the estate as a kid, wanting to be this professional footballer. Like, I've done it. And I think now that's the thing... Whereas, you know, if I had the same mindset maybe six years ago, I would be like, it's not even a shit career. But I've not. Like, I know now I've not. You know, I've done I've done things that most lads only dream of. I've, you know, and taking the medals out of it, you know, I've travelled the world, like, maybe not seen what I'd like to see with football because, you know, you're on a schedule. But, you know, there's so many... There's so many more benefits as well to winning trophies, life experiences, everything, you know, the people you meet... Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I've done. I've done class. I'm so not. What are the one. lessons you're going to take then from that incredible set of experiences into this next chapter of your life? Well, I'd like to think again. It's it's helped me grow, so I'm a better person from everything. If I can help other people doing it or on their way through, just a bit of perspective on stuff, and you know, I'd I'd like to be able to do that. Well, listen, mate. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Oh, it's a People have watched this unfold, not actually knowing the true story. Yeah. And for you to come on and share it in the way you have, it's helpful for people who didn't know, but it's probably more helpful for people who are still to come. No, oh, thank you. No, hopefully it will it will help. Top man. Thanks, thank, mate, you. Cheers, thank you so much for coming and sharing that. Look at that, loved it.